Uh, so I'm Tim Outen. I'm a senior product manager on the Ansible team. Uh, I was actually with the original Ansible company, and I've been along for the ride to Red Hat and then to, to IBM. And uh, I've been working on how Ansible can uh, integrate with and help automate things happening in the container native space. So one of the things being from, you know, working for Red Hat is that we looked into, uh, once we started this effort, how we could start to help automate what's happening in OKD and what's happening in OpenShift clusters. So what I was presenting here was like the 1.0 that we came up with uh, initially and how it came together. And I'm going to try to just speed through this. Um, uh, there's a lot of went on here and we could go a whole lot deeper. Uh, I mean, uh, put together a demo if we have time for it. Um, if not, we can provide the code. So uh, like I said, that's, that's my background where I'm coming from there. I was a programmer at one time, I used to develop and then became a PM and then they took my keyboard away from me and said, you are no longer allowed to code. Um, um, but I get to work on this type of stuff. Uh, Fabian, you wanna say a few things? Yeah, um, I'm Fabian von Feilich. I'm a uh, software engineer in the OpenShift org. I, I work on operator framework. Um, I've been involved in like the Ansible Kubernetes integration space um, since pretty much right after I got to Red Hat five years ago. Um, so I've just been working on building out like the Python uh, clients uh, and then integrating those Python clients with Ansible modules and things like that just to have like better sort of like full like application to infra uh, level integration uh, so that people who are using Ansible in their like traditional IT things can kind of more easily transition to the Kubernetes space without having to upend all of their tooling, logging, monitoring, um, et cetera. Um, and I'll cut it there so that we have time for the whole presentation. Right. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, so the first thing I should mention, if it's not apparent by who's presenting to you, is that this was a joint effort between the Ansible team and the OpenShift team. Uh, Fabian was one of the engineers that uh, came over and worked with us uh, in developing this, and we had some of our own people from the Ansible team working together on this. So uh, this is truly a joint effort that happened out there. Uh, so just diving in, uh, I'm gonna like so I'm gonna speed through this. So this thing that we're talking about, community.okd, is an Ansible content collection for automating and managing the unique capabilities of OKD and OpenShift systems. And the keyword there is unique, and I'm gonna come back to that. Now, I know I'm not talking to an Ansible um, group here, so you might be wondering, well, what, what's a collection? Uh, you might be familiar with Ansible, but in, in uh, the last year or two, we've had this huge effort going on to separate the core engine that, that Ansible's known for, that command line tool, and the what we call the content, so that they're separate and that they can move independently. Uh, one of the problems we ran into with our batteries included approach was that you had to wait for the next release of Ansible to come out to get new features for um, a, a cloud service or, or some type of other application or API change, and, and, and it was just getting way too bogged down. So we came up with this thing called uh, Ansible Content Collections that we've been moving towards we're most of the way through, or it's just short for our collection. And it's a new format for organizing Ansible content so that it's independent of the engine and can be um, um, added and installed and updated independently of what's happening in that. So uh, what we're talking about here is one of those collections that is specific to working with OKD uh, and OpenShift here. So like I said, uh, just to review that then, and so, so uh, this is to focus on the unique capabilities of OKD and OpenShift systems. We also have another collection, which has been now renamed Kubernetes.core, and that provides the baseline Kubernetes and Helm 3 automation uh, capabilities out there. So if you're working uh, with OKD and, 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 and OpenShift, you're probably gonna use both of these collections together in your, your playbooks, and the stuff that's baseline, you would um, work with the stuff that's in Kubernetes.core, and then when it comes to the things that are specific that OKD adds on top of that, then you would you would pull from uh, the, the community OKD collection. Uh, a couple other side notes, uh, if you go out and start researching this that you might become uh, confused or, or, or wonder about, is uh, uh, community OKD is the, is the upstream of, of a collection called redhat.openshift and that that is the supported offering that we put together and put out there to customers. So it's one and the same, it's just one's, one's the 
the downstream and once the upstream of that content. Um, another quick side note is originally our Kubernetes content started off as a community effort and was called community.kubernetes. We're going through the process of changing the name, uh, migrating the repo, things like that. So they're, they're essentially the same, but the uh, community.kubernetes is going away for marketing and business reasons and is going to be called community or uh, kubernetes.core. All right. So that was just a little background so you know what you're looking at here. So let's talk about what is in this collection. Uh, so, so what we did when we, when we pulled together this effort uh, last summer to make something that was supportable, that, that we put full-time resources on, we worked together with, um, um, is we, we looked at the, what was in that community.kubernetes collection and said, all right, uh, we need to break this into two parts because what had happened is, is it was just done through community co contributions coming in and it was, it was um, mostly uh, baseline Kubernetes, but some uh, OpenShift specific features had rolled in and then we were getting kind of uh, complaints from both sides, people that were trying to use OKD OpenShift and saying, uh, hey, this is missing. And then there were people on the baseline uh, uh, Kubernetes crowd coming to us and saying, hey, what is this stuff that's in here that it's operating different than it should? So we decided the best thing to do was then to, to split this stuff out into their own collections so that they could both move and focus on each other's communities um, better rather than trying to find this like um, middle ground. So uh, that was the, the one of the first big things that, that Fabi and other engineers uh, uh, took on. Uh, the other thing that I mean, was very, very helpful in was getting proper CI testing, uh, including Prow integration into this so that all of what we were doing got run against the latest uh, builds that were happening there. That was something that unfortunately wasn't happening in the previous uh, collection and work. Uh, so we migrated a whole lot of communi uh, community content over uh, uh, that was OpenShift specific, an inventory plugin, an OC connection plugin. There was a, uh, uh, an OpenShift auth module that was called Capes Auth at the time. It was renamed. And then we created a, um, a module specifically for working with declarative um, resources, but it gave it the added logic for working with things like, um, I'm trying to remember some of them, deployment configs and projects and things that are specific to OpenShift that the Kubernetes core module would sort of trip on um, there. So uh, uh, one of the things that was uh, a little interesting that we went through is uh, Ansible's added namespaces and we decided to make use of that. Um, uh, and so we had the Cates module that, like I said, handled the baseline Kubernetes declarative APIs. So rather than create a, a totally different named one, we decided to use the Kate's name again because there are, you, you don't have to do it fully qualified like, like I've shown here. Um, it, it would make it a lot easier for people to move or, or port their playbooks between baseline Kubernetes and then moving to OpenShift um, in that regard because then they would just have to switch what namespace they were pulling that module from. So there's a little side note, more advanced thing. Uh, and then we created a few modules. So this is an area that we were, we went, did a quick survey and said, well, what are the most common things people are trying to automate with OpenShift right now to figure out what is in the 1.0? And the, and the two things that came up was here was the, the ability to ex, uh, expose a, a route, uh, which, which is sort of like the um, expose in Kubernetes, but the added stuff that you can do uh, in OpenShift. And then the other was was the uh, templates that, that came up, the ability to to render and, and optionally apply those to what you were doing were also things that we were seeing a lot of people that were trying to use Ansible with OpenShift were, were trying to do and struggling and we wanted to make that easier. So we created those two modules there. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Like I said, I sped through a lot of stuff. Um, do we wanna take the time for a demo? I think we we actually have the time. Well, there was one question in there. Okay. And, Sorry, and I, yeah, I can't see the chat unfortunately on the mic. That's okay, but I think you might have answered it. James, you were asking, will playbooks written for community OKD um, work without changes when used with Red Hat dot OpenShift? Uh, yes, as long as yes, there, there should be no no issue there. You just uh, 
have to be put a little bit of care into how you're managing your namespaces. If you do it fully qualified, like I showed back here, you would have to do a search and replace, but you don't have to do it this way. Um, and I would recommend not doing it this way if that's what you want, is the ability to go between the two easily. Um, there's, a, there's a way to create like a namespace search path at the beginning of your playbook. Uh, and then you don't have to do this stuff, the, the fully qualified stuff in your, in your, uh, in your plays and your roles. Is there a reason why uh, the Red Hat OpenShift whatevers wouldn't also provide the community OKD name if they're going to effectively be identical? Um, that, that, that was more of a marketing issue of our of customers getting confused to what is supported and what is not. And so we decided to do it through the naming to make it apparent. Okay. Um, yeah. There was also like legal it. reasons that we couldn't use uh, OpenShift or Red Hat in a um, downstream. The oh, like, well, I'm sorry, in upstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, JBoss all over again, yay. <laughs> I, I know, look, I, I cannot tell you, Fabian is my witness. I almost lost my mind trying to deal with this. I did not want this, but unfortunately, like I'm not a lawyer either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm annoyed, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, me too, honestly. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So there's a couple so. of things in the... Oops. Okay. And James is, Ansel is pushing very hard to get people to use the fully qualified name. This is going to make broken playbooks and roles when trying to switch to OKD and OCP. Um, yeah, that's more of an, we've done it for awareness and also clarity. When, when you're dropping in a single task to document something, you don't see all the other stuff you could have done at the command line or in the playbook declaration. And then it, the, you may, people may get confused over time as you have modules with the same name appearing in different collections entirely. Um, that it, it was it's just for clarity of that type of documentation. We're not recommending that that everything you do should be done in with fully qualified namespaces um, in your actual work. It's more of um, us getting this concept across and also in the clarity of when you're only taking a, a snippet and dropping it in, um, you could lose someone. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, James. All right, so I'm going to demo some of the uh, features that we've added in the newly released uh, community.okd Ansible collection. Um, which contains a variety of modules and plugins uh, that uh, make it a little bit easier to inter interact with the OpenShift API. Um, so, uh, first things first, let's look at what we did around image streams. We added some special handling so that we can kind of better handle resources that are referencing image streams without causing unnecessary redeployments. Um, so this is what the basic module invocation looks like for the Kates module. Um, the community.okd.kates module is very similar to the Kubernetes Kates module, um, except that it has some of this special handling. For example, projects, if you don't have permission to go to create a project, it will instead issue a project request uh, and, and handle that whole API flow, um, which the core Kubernetes uh, module cannot. Um, so this will just go ahead and create a project named testing um, you know, kind API version, it'll just send it right through to the API. Um, I'm just going to kick it off on the right here. So if we look at returned a lot, uh, a lot of that is because of this managed fields uh, field that's returned, but this is what the API returned when we issued a create with this definition. We can see we have a project here. Uh, it, it's got the name of testing, that's pretty much it. Um, so next, let's go ahead and create an image stream. Let's look at what that image stream looks like. So we can see here, it's just uh, a regular uh, Kubernetes manifest image stream.yaml. Um, and we're going to be pulling in the Python Docker image. Uh, and you can see here, we, you can just reference a file directly, uh, much as you could with kubectl or, or any of the other uh, you know, common utilities. 
So let's go ahead and create that image stream, which should import that Python image. All right, so you can see that it was created. Uh, we see the spec that's returned here and the status, uh, which gives us the new, uh, the location of the container in the uh, OpenShift image registry. Um, so next, let's create a deployment config to reference this image stream we just made. Uh, we can look at what this looks like real quick. Um, it's basically going to just, it's going to use that base Python image. It's going to spin up just a basic HTTP server. Um, and we can see we have uh, some environment variable set. And then it has this image change trigger um, that will basically say, you know, if, 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 the, if, if the image stream gets a new tag, then automatically update our deployment to use it. Um, and it will also mean that in this spec, OpenShift will update that Python, that image that it's referencing to be the image from the local registry instead. So let's go ahead and create that deployment config. Um, and you can see here, we have this wait and wait condition. Um, this will basically look in the conditions array on the status of an object, and it won't end the task until this condition is true. So we're basically creating this deployment config and we're just going to wait until it reports that it is available. So here we can see it's ready. Um, if we scroll up, we can go past all of the managed field stuff. So we have a deployment config, hello world DC in the testing namespace, and we can see here this spec does in fact have the image replaced by the uh, image stream uh, reference and it's a, a specific SHA um, as opposed to what we put into the spec initially, which was just Python. So now we're just going to create, we're going to run this exact task over again. We're going to recreate the deployment config. Now, because the deployment config is already there, uh, the modules will, will see that, and rather than issuing a create, which would obviously fail, um, they're, they're just going to issue a patch instead, so that any difference in this deploying config definition from what is currently in the API server um, would then should result in it to be, in it to be redeployed. And uh, we'll note, because we have this image field from the API changed to the registry, Whereas in the deployment config, we just reference it as Python. So there is actually a difference between our local file and the file in the API currently. So, but if we run it, we can see that even though there's a difference between the local file and the file in the API, uh, it reports no change. Uh, it issued a patch, but it issued the patch using the trigger because it knew that this image field is one that's managed by another controller, and there's no sense in wrestling with that controller for control of that field. Um, and this is especially relevant if you're uh, writing an operator or something like that, where if you're referencing these image streams from uh, an operator, it would then lead to infinite reconciliations as the deployment config continually emitted new events, and your operator continually went and tried to change it back. Okay, so um, now we can do the exact same thing using uh, a regular deployment. Uh, you can see here, uh, deployments can actually be made to use the image streams uh, using this special annotation, which tells it what container to pick uh, and what to replace. Um, so uh, if we go and we go ahead and create this deployment, yes. Um, so that will deploy it. It's using the same base image, so hopefully this will be pretty quick. Um, and then in, while we wait for that, uh, and you can see here, wait, um, while we wait for that to finish, uh, here we're issuing only a patch request to replace only the fields that we specify. So we only want to replace spec, template, spec, containers. We want to replace the container named hello world with the Python image. Again, this should result in a change, except because these are the OpenShift modules and not the core ones. Uh, we know that we don't want to update that because it, it's not it's not going to stick. So there's no point in doing that work. Um, okay, cool. So 
uh, that's the end of the image stream. So uh, next, let's look at what we added for routes. So um, routes are basically uh, OpenShift's uh, method for uh, creating ingress. Um, so here, let's go ahead and just create this simple deployment. It'll deploy a hello OpenShift container that runs a Docker container that basically just outputs hello OpenShift uh, in, in over HTTP. So um, we go ahead and do that. We'll create the service as well to expose that um, port. And then uh, we will look here at the OpenShift route module, community.okd.openshift route. OpenShift route is approximately equivalent to uh, OC create route. Um, it can expose most of the same stuff. So here we can see we reference the service that we just created that exposes that container that we just spun up. Um, and we're going to create it every, all of the stuff in the default namespace. So uh, when we create that route with the fewest possible arguments, just giving it service and namespace, we can see that it returned this object, which includes this URL. Um, we can go ahead. hit that ourselves and we can see well I can see let's that it outputs hello openshift when we visit this route now um, and we can verify this from the enhanceable task by attempting to hit that URL and we can see that it also returns the content um, and uh, here you can look through the code to see all of these different uh, uh, methods um, I'm not going to go through all of them now, but basically there's a lot of different arguments you can pass to route. Uh, again, it's roughly equivalent to create, uh, OpenShift create, or OC create route. Um, so uh, you can do custom names, you could allow, you know, TLS or disallow TLS or make TLS redirect. Um, all different kinds of things, all exposed through the uh, module without needing to, you know, get in there and, and do this sort of definition uh, by hand. All right, so let's just skip through the rest of this route stuff. OK. Um, all right, the third thing I wanted to look at, uh, we've added the ability to interact with the OpenShift OAuth server. Uh, directly through this module um, called community.okd.openshift.auth. Um, so first, let's go ahead and create um, this secret, which will contain the information for this user, uh, a username of test and a password of testing123. Uh, let's go ahead and configure the HT password identity provider so that it uses this secret that we just created uh, to uh, verify users, and we'll go ahead and create the test user, and we'll mark it saying that it uses the HT password provider, uh, and it's the user test there. Uh, and we'll create a cluster role binding. This cluster role binding will give our new user uh, cluster reader access, uh, so it should be able to see all the things in the cluster. Um, so next, we're just going to use this community.kubernetes.kates cluster info module which will return information about how we're connected to the server, what the host is, what authentication parameters we're using, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're just going to store that in this cluster info variable. So let's go ahead and get that API URL. So you can see here all the information that that module returns. Uh, it returns all the information about the connection. It returns information about what APIs are supported by the uh, server that you're connecting to and a bunch of stuff like that, uh, as well as client and server version. Um, so next we come to the actual invocation of the OpenShift auth module. So you can see here we're just saying login is the user test with the password 123 to this host that we just pulled from uh, the cube config that we're using to connect right now. So let's go ahead and obtain that access token. And there we go. So you can see that we ran that and it returned this API key uh, that we can use to authenticate. Um, and now that we have that information, we're going to use that API key stored in this auth variable here. Uh, and we're going to use that host that we picked up before in order to see if we actually can list pods, which we should be able to because we have cluster reader access. So here we go. Here we can see 
all those pods and, and we listed them in testing namespace. So these are all the pods that we created during that image stream demo just a little bit ago. Okay, um, next, we also added the ability to interact with um, uh, OpenShift templates, which are, are basically a way that you can either locally or in the server um, set up some, some basic templating or without you know using Helm or the Ansible templating language or any of the other uh, options that are out there right now. So um, the Nginx example template is one that's included by default in an OpenShift installation, um, and it pretty much does what you'd expect, which is create an Nginx deployment. Um, so that example lives in the OpenShift namespace. And then here we can pass the parameters. So we want to deploy it to, to the OpenShift namespace as well, and we're just going to give it the name test123. So, oh, And also, we are putting it in a rendered state, which means that we don't want to go ahead and create the resources. We just want to see what resources would be created. So let's go ahead and render that template. So we can see here, this, these are the resources that would be created. Um, it would create a service that exposes our Nginx uh, pod. It would create a route that exposes it um, on the, you know, uh, that would expose the ingress for it. And uh, a build config for building the image from a Git repository and a deployment config for actually deploying it and, and the pods. Um, and it's all hooked up to the uh, Nginx example. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, and it's all. Apologies, lost my train of thought for a second. Yeah, and it's all hooked up with the image stream tag. Um, so now that we have these resources, we're storing them in this result variable here. Um, we can go ahead and create those rendered resources um, by looping through them. And uh, this apply parameter means that we will be using, um, you know, uh, the, basically the equivalent of, of kubectl apply in order to create them. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and we can see that it made all of those resources uh, that we had uh, rendered before. Build config, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's not delete those resources. We'll give it some more time. And then you also have the option, rather than create like rendering and then creating them manually, that you could also um, process and then create them directly uh, in one step. Um, and we should see pretty much nothing change here um, because it is the same uh, resources. All right. Um, and finally, the uh, information uh, the, the, the last little bit that I wanted to highlight um, was the OpenShift inventory plugin, which gives you the ability to use OpenShift as a dynamic inventory. Um, and basically, this means that the, the plugin will go look at the cluster, look at all of the pods in the cluster, and add those pods to your Ansible inventory as targetable hosts. So you can see here, um, this second play targets the namespace testing pods group. Um, this is a group that is automatically created by the OpenShift inventory plugin. And basically, uh, it sh will target all of the um, pods that are in the testing namespace. So let's go ahead um, and run that. So you can see the first task, uh, ignoring this meta one, the first task that we will run is setup. Um, now, it is important to note running modules other than raw uh, does require Python on the container. So we can see here this test one, two, three, one deploy deployment container um, does, doesn't have Python installed. Uh, and so this is not going to work on it. So it, it was failed. Um, but we can see these test one, two, three Nginx example, the hello world DC and the hello world deployment pods that we spun up earlier all were found and setup was run. And we can verify that setup runs successfully um, by looking at the value of the test environment variable. Because if you remember, in our deployment configs, we uh, added that environment variable, just test with a value of test. And you can see here, it output in the hello world DC that the value of test is test. And in the hello world deployment, the value of test is test. And of course, in the Nginx example, it does not have 
this environment variable to find. So um, we had a failure there. And then uh, last, uh, you can, as long as there is Python on the pod that you're targeting, you can copy files to and from the host um, from, from Ansible, making it so that it is, as long as there's Python installed in the pod, basically, or in the container, um, there, there's basically, you can do anything that you could normally do with Ansible there. All right, and that is all that I wanted to demo. So thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks, thanks, Bobby. Uh, it was, that was great. I hopefully it got across like all the different things that you can do to, to automate and cut down on all the command line stuff you would have to do in manual work and repetitive work every time you would deploy a cluster or do anything. The, the, the big question that we have for, for, for you is besides using it, trying out, seeing how we did in our, our 1.0, is uh, you know what could we do next? What do you want to see in this next? There's there's a lot of areas that we didn't touch on, and the question we kept asking ourselves was, well, would that be useful? Well, which one of these is a priority? Which one is not? Uh, that's the type of feedback that we're looking for. Uh, we we got a good core set of feedback, mostly from from Red Hat consultants and a couple other people we knew in the community that were doing work with Ansible and OpenShift, and they gave us that initial batch of use cases and we've essentially covered them all right now. So we're wondering, where do we go next? So that's the feedback we'd love to hear. Um, for those of you who are interested, in, like I will give this deck to uh, Diane to, to send around, uh, but uh, these are some of the repos of, of the content you were looking at, starting with, with Fabian's um, the demo code that he was just running through and, and the repos where we're developing the collections we've been talking about. And then there's a bunch of uh, blog posts if you want to go deeper and and read about this stuff uh, in, in in more detail, maybe more elegantly than I've been speaking uh, about it. So uh, that is all that we had. Well, that sounds good. It, um, I think we we could use some feedback from the community on um, maybe some uh, uh, maybe more uh, hint useful examples, the example was good, Fabian, not that it was bad, but just um, how, how people um, would use this in, in production. And so Joseph and other folks who are doing that, um, your feedback will be most welcome. So, so one, uh, ahead, Christian. one thing I'd love to see, and maybe it's already part of, of the playbooks, um, is kind of um, standard operating procedures for uh, admin tasks, like uh, derotation, um, I'm not sure we probably don't have that yet, but something like uh, snapshotting and backing uh, the backup of cluster states. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Is, do, do we have a playbook for key rotation, for example? Um, no. So the content there was mostly focused on just kind of like providing those basic building blocks, um, kind of the foundational work in order to uh, allow us to build more things on top of that. But collections do allow you to currently distribute roles. Um, and I believe in the future, it's planned to allow you to distribute playbooks as well. Um, and so the hope is that as we've sort of built this out, um, get more community involvement, um, get some, uh, you know, better subject matter experts. I deal a lot, you know, working with operators with the Kubernetes API and low level components and things like that. I have less experience with sort of higher level cluster administration. Um, and so uh, that's definitely like we, we would love to have playbooks and roles in or that would enable users yeah. to like very easily automate um, those tasks. But, um, you know, that's sort of like now is the point where we go out to the community and, and like, you know, look for people who, who know about that, don't necessarily need to do you know, all of it. But if they have, you know, requests for features like that, um, documentation, maybe some like getting started places like that, those would all be very useful things for us to see pop up in that repo. Um, in order to help us prioritize and also in order to help us understand what exactly those cluster administration tasks are and how we can help automate them.